All right, so we start. So now we're going to, um, now we're going to have some, some fun. Okay, so let's go back, uh, <clears throat> let's go back to our, our, our main problem. Um, and um, we want to ask the question, We want in kinematic space to find some question to ask whose answer is going to give us the amplitude, it's going to explain why they're associated with a polytope, it's going to explain projective invariance, it's going to explain all those uh, uh, things that we wanted to make manifest that were that are hidden by uh, the usual way of uh, thinking about things. Okay, so but let's just begin again by asking uh, th the question. What the heck can we do? What can we do just with XIJs? That's all we have. All right. That's our space. We have to find some way of asking an interesting question in this space that's going to give us all these uh, fancy things like a sosahedra, blah, blah, blah. The amplitudes, all that stuff. Okay. So, and here, uh, again, there's a parallel of the story of the amphitohedron. So if you don't know, it, 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 uh, you don't need to know it. But the one advantage that we have, the one thing that we have is we have this ordering. We have an ordering. One, two, up to N. And so that means in particular, there's an action uh, that, that the xijs are naturally are naturally ordered. I mean, I can take i to i plus one, j to j plus one. I have a cyclic symmetry under i and j goes to i and j plus n. Okay, so I have an ordering, and that's going to be the first crucial thing. Um, so so having an ordering, and then at an important point inserting the word positivity is going to bring some positive geometries to life in kinematic space of xij right that's the first thing that we want to uh, see okay so let's uh, uh in order to do that let's first actually look at the kinematic space. Okay, again, it looks, it looks as sort of boring as possible. What could be exciting about uh, the space of XIJs? But well, let's look, look at it for a second. All right, so, um, so what I'm drawing here is, uh, what I'm drawing here is, um, let me see if I can annotate it here actually. One, one second. Um, no. well, that's okay. Yeah. What, what, what I'm drawing here are just drawing all the xijs, nothing else. Okay. So here, that's x13, x14, x15, x16. But I'm using the fact that I have this cyclic structure on the indices in order to organize them in the obvious way. So, what is the obvious way? I start from one guy like x13. And I just translate the other index by the by the shift of the cyclic symmetries. Here is one three, then one four, one five, one six. This would be the case of seven particles scattering, let's say. Um, and so you see, as I keep on going, I would eventually hit one seven. But remember that i i plus one uh, are all zero. So one seven is zero. That's why it's denoted here in black. The guys that are in red are honest variables. But one seven is zero, it's denoted in black. Similarly, at the other end, one two is zero. Okay. And so you see that just the act, just the act of writing down the uh, the variables already brings a sort of interesting strip to life. Okay, so I have uh, I just have all the XIJs, nothing else. 
but there are these two vertical lines. And that's actually why I decided to draw them in 45 degrees in this way, just because I do have these boundaries where XII plus one, one, seven, two, one, three, two on one side, one, two, two, three, three, four, et cetera, on the other side are zero. Okay, so there are these boundaries where it's zero that I've chosen to denote, uh, I've chosen to denote with these um, uh, black lines. Okay, now um, there's another interesting thing about this uh, picture. Uh, if we go back uh, for a second, um, so, it, so this is something I should have emphasized before and I've actually used it implicitly a few times. I'm sorry, I didn't emphasize it uh, when, I, when it first came up. It's an important point that xij is just equal to xji, right? There's no difference, it's the same chord, right? So we have this, uh, we have this equivalence between xij and xji. And that's also reflected, uh, that's reflected in this picture with, uh, um, with the fact that there's a, well, there's a sort of symmetry here. So, uh, so here is one three, but one three is also repeated up here, except that it's three one. Of course, it would also be repeated way up here as one three again, but, it's, uh, but it, has a, it, it has its uh, cousin on the other side where we just interchange I and I, J and uh, J, I over there, okay? So, if I imagine, so if I imagine that this is kind of a grid as an approximation to something uh, or just sampling on a grid of something that would be valid in the continuum, then, uh, and if I label the points here by X and T, the way I've uh, denoted, now I've given them suggestive names of X and T to be suggestively like time and space. We're gonna come back to, to why that's apt in, in, uh, in a moment, but, we're just talking about labeling. Uh, we see that there's a, there's an interesting uh, symmetry here. That the, uh, it's like a it's like a uh, um, it's like a Mobius strip that uh, that I have to identify x and t over here with one minus x and one plus t over there. And then if I go again with sort of period two, uh, I would come back to x and two plus t on the other side. Okay. So is that is that clear so far? So we're just drawing the X's, but there's a natural way to draw them by the action of the uh, cyclic rotation of the, of the indices. And the fact that the boundaries are zero uh, asks you to draw them in this strip. Okay. Now, um, in fact, we could go a little further, like what would it take if I wanted to actually uh, uh, really just keep one copy of all the variables, if I want to keep one copy of all, all the variables, then I have to take some chunk out of this, uh, um, uh, out of this strip. For example, uh, I can do it in many ways. Uh, I've shown you two of them here. We're going to be focusing a lot on this right triangle example just because it's easier to uh, draw, uh, although I, everything I'm going to tell you will work in, in, in general. Um, but notice that here, everything in green, all the variables are uh, are captured once and only once. So I have one three over here, but three one is not there. I have uh, two four, but four two is out there. So every one, all of the X's are covered once and only once on the inside of this triangle. It's interesting, there's no way of making this choice of choosing one and only one X um, in any other way. Uh, it, sorry, in any way that preserves the, uh, that manifestly cyclically invariant. The whole strip is cyclically invariant, of course, but any way of like taking out a chunk that covers all the variables once and only once will just break that, that symmetry. It's just life. Here's another way of doing it. It can look a slightly more uh, complicated. Okay, so, um, so these are ways of uh, choosing a region. And if I, again, draw it in the continuum, I can sort of choose any surface here and its cousin under the Mobius, uh, under that Mobius identification, and anything inside this band will cover all the variables once and only once. Okay, so um, uh, our, so far so good with that. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. So now we're gonna um, now we're gonna uh, explain why I gave uh, I gave uh, these variables the name x and t. So let's come back here. <clears throat> So we're going to see the full force of this uh, in a bit, but um, but we're now going to see that there really is some kind of causal 
structure in kinematical space. So I, I stress again, not to be a broken record, um, uh, just going back to the very beginning, but this, now we see more, more vividly what, what we're up against, right? This is our space, the space of just XIJs. There's nothing that looks like a uh, metric. There's not like a normal space. We don't, have, uh, we don't have time. We don't have any obvious notion of dynamics, causality, nothing. That's the sort of magnitude of the challenge of trying to figure out how to get what looks like space time and quantum mechanical processes out um, of something that seems to have no structure in it, almost no structure in it at all. And so necessarily we have to be more adventurous. We don't know what the rules are. We're like uh, stumbling around looking to discover what the rules might be. Uh, the, the, and uh, the fascinating thing is there, there do appear to be rules. And now we're, st we're starting to see what some of them look like pretty uh, con con concretely. But the first thing I want to do here is justify why I gave the, the names T and X. Okay? And, um, and there's something kind of cool here. Uh, let me, um, and we'll see the full force of this. Uh, um, more. But one thing that you will remember is that it was very important. Um, so beforehand, we're, we're just labeling, we're just thinking about XIJs as associated with arcs, uh, with, with associated with, uh, with uh, uh, some diagonals of these polygons, right? Now all we've done is go to a space where every diagonal is some point here, okay? So that's, that's, all, that's all we've done. But remember, there was something important about whether arcs cross or not. So I'm drawing it a little bit more abstractly. They don't have to be next to each other. But it was important whether or not we had this, uh, uh, whether we had ij cross kl or not. OK? And so now what I want to dis uh, discuss is if ij intersects kl, what does that mean? For what this picture looks like. What does that mean for what these arcs look like in this uh, in the in the space that we just introduced? And it means something very simple. It just means uh, It just means the following. You can easily check this for yourself. <clears throat> IJ intersects KL if, if and only if the following happens. So here's IJ, there's KL. So we see we have these uh, four natural chords. We have IJ, KL, KJ, and IL. And I've drawn them here. The claim is that the chords cross. The chords cross if and only if on this side, you see that IJ is the past corner of what looks like, if I now think of this as time and space, if I think about T as time and X as space, if IJ is the past corner, KL is the future corner, and IK and JL are the left and right corners of a causal diamond that fits in this space time, in this quote unquote kinematic space time. So, so, so. What would happen if uh, IJ and KL don't cross is either KL would be space-like separated from IJ or KL would be so far apart, so far in the future of uh, IJ that if I tried to make a causal diamond, it couldn't close, okay? So it couldn't close living inside this uh, strip of the of uh, space-time. So that's the first indication of some causal structure in the space, which is uh, really interesting that the chords crossing on the side of the polygon, which I remind you is the incompatibility of uh, different uh, non mutually non-local poles as far as the amplitude is concerned, 
Uh, the chords crossing here correspond precisely to whether the two chords have a well-defined causal relationship to each other. A causal diamond, I, I remind you, is just the intersection of the future light cone of one point and the past light cone of the other. So everything inside the causal diamond can be affected by the guy in the past and can be measured by the guy in the uh, future. Okay, so it's a very natural notion. And so it's sort of uh, fascinating to see this connection between uh, uh, the, the crossing of chords and the notion of compatibility and some notion of causality in this kinematic space, right? So this kinematic space is slowly coming to life. Now we see that it has a natural notion of time and causality, <clears throat> but we still need to ask, find a question. So now we still need to find uh, a question to ask in this kinematic space. And what we're going to do is we're going to solve the wave equation. Right now, I'm going to first um, remind you of some simple facts of the wave equation in one plus one dimension. And then we will apply it to this particular uh, example. Um, uh, sorry, guys, I'm trying to. Can you have you been not seeing me this whole time? All right. We've been seeing the, okay, the screen, I mean. Oh, okay, fine, okay. Well, but now, now at least the, the video is working. All right, good. Um, okay, we, I'm gonna solve the wave, wave equation in one, one plus one dimension. Um, and <clears throat> uh, so first, uh, what, what's, the, what's, the, uh, uh, what's the wave equation in general? It's uh, dt squared minus dx squared capital X equals zero. Uh, I'm going to imagine there's a source on the right-hand side, so I'll call the source little c. That could depend on t and x. Now, as usual, we can introduce these variables u and v that are like x plus or minus t over two. And the wave equation becomes uh, du dv x equals c. So if here is t and x, the u and v variables are the 45 degree directions, like that, say. Um, I forget which one I call which. Okay, so this is, this is the equation that we care about. And now I want to uh, tell you some simple things about the wave equation. Uh, some you, you all know implicitly, but I want to highlight some of them. One of them is that there's a Gauss's law. You can think of the wave equation as a differential equation, uh, but there's also an integral form. And the integral form is really nice in one plus one dimensions, and it exactly has to do with causal diamonds. The integral form says that if you take a causal diamond, past, future, left, right, that x at the past plus x at the future minus x left minus x right is equal to the total charge. So the integral, if there's some, uh, if C is the density here, the sort of integral of C inside that diamond is the total charge. So, so this is the first beautiful fact we're gonna use over and over again. Um, so this is Gauss's law. Uh, now you can very quickly see that it's true from the solution of the wave equation. In fact, you can go the other way and get the solution of the wave equation directly from here. And um, you'll also notice that as you shrink this diamond to zero size, this equation turns precisely into the double derivative, du dv uh, x equals c. Okay, so that's really the sense in which this is the integral form of the differential equation, which is the wave equation. But this Gauss's law formula, again, past plus future minus left minus right equals the total charge is the most sort of, is the most fundamental fact about the wave equation of which everything else follows, including the wave equation itself, right? So that's one important fact, the Gauss's law. There's a second important thing that we'll use um, uh, just, uh, just once, but we'll use it in an, in an important spot. Let's say you have a solution of the wave equation, but there are some 45 degree strip that you don't really care about. So in other words, you only care about X out here, X to the right of this strip and X to the left of this strip. Then you can make another solution of the wave equation just by removing this region, okay? Just by removing this region. 
And so just uh, scrunching away this uh, region. So we call this the scrunch operation. But what you have to do is add whatever current you had in here, you have to add as a delta function source to the juncture. And again, this is, this is obvious if you take, uh, let, let, why, is it, why is it true? Because everything follows from Gauss's law. So if I only care about the, if I only care about X outside the strip, then I just have to make sure the Gauss's law is satisfied for everything on the corners of a blue uh, diamond like this. But of course, I will satisfy it also here, uh, so long as I add whatever current I had in here to the effective source uh, here on the, on the uh, right-hand side, okay? So we can scrunch away any 45 degree regions that we want to make a new solution of the wave equation out of old ones. Okay, so, okay, so uh, now we have, a, we have a one plus one dimensional uh, kinematic space time. So we're gonna look at the wave equation in this funny kinematic space time. And I'm going to look at it in one of those in one of those regions uh, that covers that we talked about that covers all the variables once and only once. So, for example, let's draw this region. Remember, there was one of those regions that looked like a right triangle. So we're going to solve the wave equation in this region. So we're going to solve du dvx equals c in this region. And remember, there are some boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are that x equals zero on this end, and also x was equal to zero on that tip as well. Let me uh, remind you of how that works. Uh, oops. Let's just see. So, so if I go back to this to, to this picture, you see that x was zero here. One, two, two, three, three, four. All these guys are zero, <coughs> and also the the tip of this right triangle was also zero. Okay, so. Those are the those are the boundary conditions that we're talking about. Okay, so we're going to solve the wave equations with those boundary conditions. So that's kind of we're now sort of finding dynamics in this kinematic space in the space where the where the amplitudes live. We're finding some sort of uh, dynamics there, um, but we also have to inject the word positivity. And positivity here means that we have to ask that X is positive, that X stays positive everywhere, and also that the source is positive. Okay, now I'm just telling you that we're doing all these things uh, and that something is gonna come out of it. Um, uh, part of the reason for doing all these things was the experience from, uh, from previous stories where we knew once we got into the right kinematic space, we had to inject the word positivity. So it was a very natural thing. It's a very natural thing to do, but that's all we're doing. Okay, we're gonna, um, in this kinematic space, we're looking at solutions of the wave equation with positive sources that stay positive everywhere inside the, uh, the, uh, the, the chunk of the kinematic space that we're using to cover all of our variables, okay? So that's the question that we're now going, going to ask. And let's see, uh, uh, let's see what it is that, that, that we're actually doing. So um, uh, let me make uh, an important point, which is that uh, you can very easily see using the Gauss's law that if you know X here, so which we do, we know X is zero here and you know X is zero here. And so if you give me the initial values of X here, say x of u here, that actually uniquely determines x everywhere inside. So x inside is determined. You can check that very easily just by drawing a Gauss's law picture and showing that you can solve for everyone inside given uh, the values of the guys on the boundary. We'll in fact do it in a moment. Um, but <clears throat> uh, so our problem is really uh, what constraints do we put? What constraints? Uh, do we have to put on x of u so that x stays positive everywhere inside? Obviously, x of u 
if I go from here to there, it has to be positive. Well, it's zero here and it's zero there. So it's some kind of function. It's positive, got something. But it probably satisfies more constraints. That's a satisf this shape, this shape has to satisfy some constraint in order for x of u to stay positive inside everywhere. And that's uh, that's the question that um, we're going to try to uh, figure out uh, the answer to. All right, let me actually just pause for a second. Um, okay. Um, Okay, good. No, there are, there are no uh, no uh, questions yet, except um, someone asked whether uh, we've gotten to cluster algebras where, where we're secretly doing uh, things that are related to cluster algebras right now, but but we're not we don't have to know anything about them um, for this for this part. After we're done with this, we'll talk about uh, uh, we'll we'll have a proper introduction to uh, cluster algebra. Okay, so um, so I hope the question is clear. We're trying to figure out. We're trying to figure out what constraint to put on this uh, on this boundary value of the function x of u in order to guarantee that it's positive inside. Now, this is a very hard problem. It looks like we you know we have a continuous infinite amount of information we have to specify. So let's make our problem a little bit easier. Okay, so let's to begin with ask what can we say about the value of x just at one point? So I'm going to have some one point here. Let's say the point uh, I'll call it past one. What can I know about the, this point past one? What can I say about the value of x here? Well, let me draw the obvious uh, light rays in, in the picture. Okay, so light ray goes out here and bounces off this end to some point future one. Okay, um, and let me just write the Gauss law involving the points that I see in, in the picture. So I won't keep coloring it red, but remember the boundary here is red, this is red. So, uh, so this is x equals zero, this is x equals zero. So let's write the Gauss's law. The Gauss's law is past one plus future one for this diamond, for this diamond. It's past one plus future one minus this left corner, which is zero, minus this right corner, which is zero, has to equal the total charge. So, of course, we know that we have to have past one is positive. We also have to have that future is positive because we want it to be greater than or equal to zero everywhere. Um, and you see, the Gauss law is now going to give me a constraint because I can solve that future one is equal to constant minus past one. And so I've already learned something slightly interesting. I've learned that, that uh, the values of x at the values of x at p1 have got to lie between 0 and c. And that's because here, x at p1 is 0, and here, x at future 1 is 0. Right? So that's already slightly amusing that uh, I find that the, uh, that the value at one point has got to lie between, uh, has got to lie inside this uh, interval. OK? Let's keep going. Um, so here's our second example. Let's ask what happens at, if I'm interested in the value at two points. So here's a point, let's say, past one and past two. And now again, I will draw the, uh, I draw the light ray. So past one goes out to future one, past two goes to future two. And now there's some intermediate point i here that I care about as well. And so now there are three Gauss's laws that I can write down for this diamond, for that diamond, and for that diamond. Um, but let me actually, uh, let, let, uh, we, we can more efficiently just uh, use any Gauss's law we want uh, to, get, uh, uh, to get the formulas. We already know that P1 and P2 have got to be positive. But now we also want to figure out what it takes for F1, F2, and I to be positive. So let's solve for F1, F2, and I. And this is also going to show us that specifying the past points is specifying everyone else on the inside. So for example, let's solve for I. I can solve for I using this Gauss's law, right? So that Gauss's law tells me that P1 plus I minus 0 minus P2 is equal to some C. I'll just call that C. 
Now, I can solve for F1. How do I solve for F1? So let's say that this constant here, that this, uh, this integrated charge in this diamond is C prime, and in this one is C double prime. Okay, so let me solve for F1. I would get that P1 plus F1 minus zero minus zero is equal to C plus C prime. And finally, I can solve for F2 from this big Gauss's law, that one, the analog what I did uh, just a second ago, is P2 plus F2 minus zero minus zero is C double prime plus C prime. Okay, so I have succeeded then in solving for I is equal to C minus P2. Oh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, uh, is uh, um, I is C plus P2 minus P1. F1 is C plus C prime minus P1 and F2 is C double prime plus C prime minus P2. Okay, and so now I can use these to figure out uh, what the constraints are on P1 and P2. Now, what are, what are the constraints? Um, obviously, so I'm gonna now draw a picture for what where I can live in P1, P2 space, okay? Um, Obviously, obviously P1 and P2 both have to be positive. So I have to live up here somewhere. Okay, so obviously I have to live up here somewhere. But also I has to be positive. Now I is positive tells me that I, ha I have to actually be to the right of some line like this. That's from this formula. And then F1 being positive tells me that uh, P1 has got to be less than something. And F2 being positive tells me that P2 has got to be less than something. So you see that in order for everything to be consistent, I have to live inside this interesting pentagon in P1, P2 space. Okay, and it's actually uh, kind of cool that uh, that it that it's a pentagon. No matter what you choose for these constants, um, uh, so long as these constants are positive, you see, it's not guaranteed that uh, the, the, it, it's clear that there are three equations. So there are three inequalities, but it could have been that some of the inequalities were implied by others. And in fact, if the signs of the C's were random we wouldn't always get the same shape. Sometimes we get a quadrilateral, sometimes we get a pentagon and so on. But if the C is all being positive, uh, you can really see that this line comes after this point and so on, okay? So this shape always closes up to be a pentagon, exactly as I have drawn. All right, so that's kind of interesting. When we sample for two points, what we see inside looks like a pentagon. All right, now let's uh, uh, keep going. We won't actually do the algebra, but uh, let's just see uh, roughly what it looks like in the case where there are three points. So if I'm interested in sampling three points, oops, sorry, I don't know what happened to my pen here. So I have some P1, P2, and P3, future one, future two, and future three. Now I have one, two, three, four, five, six new points. I have one, two, three, four, five, six of these basic Gauss laws. And so what am I gonna get? I'm going to get six equations. Uh, already I have to have the P1, P2, P3 are positive, so I have to live in this upper orphans, but I'm gonna get six more equations. And so what I'm going to get is some kind of three-dimensional polytope with nine faces. Three I have already from P1, P2, P3, 
and six more. And what is that polytope? Well, you won't be surprised that it's the isosahedron. Okay. And now, in fact, it's this very specific picture of an isosahedron. So, um, uh, so uh, I just want to make sure you guys can see. Um, what I'm seeing. Yes, you can. Okay, great. So. This is actually what, what, what you get. Ignore the other uh, uh, labels uh, uh, for a second. But this is really drawn in that sort of P1, P2, P3 space. And you would see that, uh, that you have to lie on the inside of a three-dimensional uh, polytope. And uh, if you look at it, it's not sort of uh, maybe super obvious at first, but this is exactly, the combinatorics of this is exactly like the isosahedron that I drew before. In particular, you'll see it has five pentagonal faces. It has three square faces. There's one, there's one, um, uh, there's one. And all of the combinatorics is exactly the same as the isosahedron. In fact, this is a picture of, uh, this is a picture of uh, an isosahedron that, uh, uh, that uh, Song He and Yan Tao Bai and Gong Wen Wan and I um, uh, found from sort of physics motivations uh, a couple of years ago um, uh, without any of this connection to this, uh, uh, this, uh, this causal structure in kinematic space or anything like that, more or less sort of by, by guessing and by, uh, uh, by, uh, by playing around. So what I want to stress is it's a, very, it's a very particular isosahedron. It's a very particular realization. It's cut out with these very particular linear equations so notice it has like a lot of sides are parallel to each other and so on. So it's not it's not just just a, a random realization of the association, something with, uh, with the combinatorics of this shape, um, but it's something more more specific. And um, uh, Hugh Thomas and his students actually figured out that that this realization of the association was of relevance to uh, 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 to sort of conceptually understanding um, dozens of the association that are uh, associated with uh, other cluster algebras. I haven't told you anything about cluster algebras. Um, we'll be seeing more as they uh, come along, but this is just a, a little bit of uh, context. Um, and, um, and, and we're going to be seeing where all of these things uh, come from, from this uh, uh, kinematic space picture. But, um, but this is just to say that the, uh, that the realization of the isosahedron that we're getting from this, uh, from this uh, uh, space-time from this um, kinematical space-time picture is the specific uh, ABHY realization that was found a uh, uh, that was found a, a couple of years ago from uh, different uh, motivation. Okay, now I'm just telling you that I'm just telling you that it is um, uh, that it's the uh, ABHY association. But now let me let me tell you why it had to be. And so this is really this is uh, this this uh, discussion is really the heart of all the magic here. Okay. Um, in other words, what have we seen? We've already seen that this picture that's asking for positive solutions of the wave equation with x bigger than zero and c bigger than zero, we've seen that if I just sample it at finitely many points the way we did, we've seen that this is manifestly polytopal. I mean, just by construction, what I'm getting is something that's going to live inside a polytope just because, well, we just saw it, just because I'm putting uh, a linear positive constraints on, I'm putting linear positive constraints on, um, on all of these, uh, on all of these constants. Um, okay, so it's manifestly polytopal, but now we have to understand why does it factorize on its boundary? That's the real magic. Right, the, uh, so we have something that's a polytope, that's obvious, but now we're also going to show that it's obvious that it's a polytope, that when you go to its boundaries, it factorizes into the product of two other polytopes of the same sort. And the argument is really simple. Um, so I, I will say it in the sort of language of, the, of, the, of just this continuum picture. Um, so let's say that I have a solution of the wave equation here, du dx equals c. I have a solution. Um, uh, where x is uh, greater than or equal to zero anywhere. But I want to go to a boundary. Uh, going to a boundary means that somewhere, it's not true just that x is equal greater than, uh, uh, greater than zero, it's actually equal to zero. 
Okay, so I want to I want to set x equal to zero. Um, uh, I want to set x equal to zero somewhere. Okay, so let's say I want to set x equal to zero here. X star at this point. Okay, now here's a natural question. Where else can I set x to zero after I set it to zero here? Is there another place I could set it to zero? Well, let's shoot out the obvious light rays. Okay, so here are the obvious light rays that are shot out of x star. And now here's the central key point is that I cannot set x to zero anywhere in those regions, in those shaded regions. Why not? Uh, the reason has everything to do with our famous Gauss law. So if I have past, future, left and right, we have that past plus future minus left minus right is equal to a positive constant, is equal to C. So let's say that I put the past to zero. Let's say that, that I've put x equal to zero here. Then I cannot also set the future to zero. If I do that, I have the sum of two negative terms equals something positive. And that's a contradiction. So that's where positivity really has some teeth now, is that having decided that we're setting x to zero at this point, x star, we cannot put x to zero at any other point, which is the past or future uh, corner of a causal diamond that's connected to x star. And that's all the points in this green region. Okay, so we cannot put x star to zero anywhere in that region. Uh, we can't put any other x's to zero in that region. But there's actually more. Let's look, let's look here. Um, notice that uh, I can actually completely reconstruct everything, uh, the knowledge, if I, if I cared, if I wanted, I could reconstruct by Gauss's law, the x anywhere in this region, just by the knowledge on these boundaries. And similarly, anywhere on this region, just by the knowledge on these boundaries. So I can't put x to zero in there anywhere. And, and furthermore, I don't need to keep track of any of those variables because I can always reconstruct them just knowing what's going on on these boundaries. So as far as keeping track of what the solution is concerned, nothing, there's no reason not to scrunch these regions away. And what picture do I get after I scrunch them away? Well, I have this thing. Oops. Sorry, what do you mean by there's no reason not to scrunch them? Well, what, 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 what I mean is uh, more, more specifically, I mean that, that, uh, that uh, Every, every solution of the wave equation in this left-hand picture, I can uniquely reconstruct from a solution of the wave equation on the right-hand picture, okay? So what I've done on the right-hand picture is just remove everything in the green region. Of course, I should add this delta function source as we talked about in our discussion of scrunching, okay? But now remember that over here, I used to have x equals zero there and there. So that's x equals zero here. I still have x equals zero there. Uh, this region here has now been broken up into this region, that region, and that region. So x is zero everywhere here. Because x was zero at star, it's also zero there. So notice what I have. If you give me a solution of the wave equation in the second picture, I can uniquely reconstruct the solution of the wave equation in the original one, right? But what is the second picture? It's exactly the direct product of two smaller triangles. Okay? This is factorization. I have a solution of the wave equation for this small right triangle with the boundary conditions that it vanishes here and there. I have a solution of the wave equation with this big triangle with the boundary conditions that it vanishes at the tip and over there. Both of them have some positive sources inside. Yeah, I had to add some new positive sources on the inside of this one, but it doesn't matter. We know exactly what this tells us is that on the boundary, a positive solution of the wave equation here can, is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the direct product of positive solutions of the wave equation um, 
uh, of, uh, of, of, for two smaller primes. Okay? So that's the entire magic, is that uh, the structure of causal diamonds in this kinematic space, the solution to the wave equation, just this extremely simple structure, guarantees that we get something that's polytopal and that factorizes on its boundaries to the product of lower things. That was our goal from the very start. Our goal from the start was to make obvious both the polytopal nature uh, of the sort of full structure of the amplitudes, as well as the fact that it factorizes. Um, again, remember Feynman diagrams and strings, particles and strings don't make the polytopal nature manifest. They make the factorization manifest. Now we have the whole shebang. The polytopal nature is manifest and the fact that it factorizes on the boundaries is manifest, all coming from this different question that we've now asked in, uh, uh, in, in cinematic space. Okay, okay so, um, so having said all of that, now what is the scattering? What's the scattering amplitude? So this is, a, this is we now ask this question, we ask this question of solving the uh, wave equation, um, and that gave us some part of kinematic space, right? So we have some we have some part of xij space that we can think of as positive solutions of the wave equation with positive source. What is the scattering amplitude itself? Well, the scattering amplitude to begin with is actually a scattering form. So we have a scattering form. It's an n minus three form on this kinematical space on xij space, and this n minus three form is completely determined. Is totally determined. Is completely determined by declaring that if you take this form and you pull it back to the solutions of this wave equation. So, in other words, uh, remember these solutions of the wave equation are solving all the x's in terms of n minus three of the x's, as we saw in our example. Okay, so if we pull it back to the solution of the wave equation. Then now, now I mean, let me uh, remind you of the sort of big uh, picture here is that, um, is that we have this kinematical space. We have this huge kinematical space of xij. Um, we have this lower, but in this kinematical space of xij's, we have this, this uh, we have, um, uh, we have this part, which is the solutions of the wave equation with the uh, with the uh, with positive source. Okay, um, so if I keep the constants fixed, the solutions of the wave equations with with the positive source are a subspace in this space. So there's an n minus three dimensional subspace, and if we and on that subspace, actually maybe I should say this I should say this another way. Um, uh, we have solutions, so we have this big kinematical space, which is nn minus three over two dimensional. We have general solutions of the wave equation in this space. A general solution of the wave equation lives on an n minus three dimensional subspace, but we have the intersection of this uh, with demanding that the solution of the wave equation is positive. So that's that the x's are positive. So the general picture we have in kinematical space is that when we restrict the positive, uh, when, when we restrict the solutions of the wave equations, what the x's are positive, that intersection looks like an isosahedron. So this, this intersection looks like, uh, looks like an isosahedron. And um, this form is completely determined by becoming on the solution of the wave equation, becoming the canonical form of the corresponding isosahedron. Okay, so there is a so so there is, and it's uniquely determined by that. So um, the the sort of novelty here is that the space is much higher dimensional. Okay, so we have this big high dimensional space, but solving the wave equation forces us to a subspace of the correct dimensionality, demanding that it's a positive solution of the wave equation forces us to see a positive geometry there. Uh, but then what this form is, is entirely determined by the requirement that, that it becomes the canonical form of that, of that isosahedron. Okay. So now, 
this fact, so again, omega is just completely fixed. So I have the solution of the wave equation, um, this, these positive solutions of the wave equation. So omega is totally fixed by the fact that omega on the solution of the wave equation is equal to the canonical form of the associahedron that we just saw associated with these positive solutions of the wave equation. And now some important points. It's trivially projectively invariant. So that sort of magical fact that we could assign signs, blah, blah, to make everything work is just totally obvious here. It's obvious here, why? Why is it obvious? Because, uh, because, uh, uh, because the form, uh, it, it's obvious because the form only has singularities on the polytope and nowhere else. In particular, there's no singularities at infinity. Uh, and so that's what's guaranteeing that it's trivially projective invariant. Um, and uh, a number of other nice things happen. Um, if you actually pull back, if you look at this pullback, uh, uh, so to get this canonical form of the isosahedron, it's indeed exactly equal just to the volume form on that subspace multiplied by the actual amplitude. So that's how we can extract the actual amplitude. In other words, the phenomenon that we saw before always happens that all the signs go away and we just get all plus signs for all of the poles. And that, that's actually, uh, that's, a, a, that's a nice fact about the, uh, about the, um, about what the normal vectors of the facets of the isosahedron look like that I don't have time to explain in more detail now, but we'll, 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 we'll talk about it uh, in, in a more general setting when we talk about the uh, cluster algebras next. Um, and uh, finally, um, so that's what the form is sort of invariantly. Now, uh, the isosahedron, is a simple polytope. It's sort of kind of clear that uh, that every vertex uh, is just obtained by setting a bunch of x's to zero. In fact, what are the vertices of the isosahedron? The vertices are exactly the triangulations of the polygon. That was the point. So the vertices are what we would think of as the Feynman diagrams or the duals to the Feynman diagram. So. And, but it's exactly, the, it, for example, in three dimensions, there are three X's that go to zero to give me a vertex. So the association is simple. Remember, we had a formula for the, we had a formula for the canonical form of any simple polytope as a sum over the vertices of the polytope of the D log, in this case, of all of the, uh, the product of the D log of all the xij's with ij in the triangulation um, with some sign. Okay, now what do you think the name of that formula for the canonical form is? This is known as Feynman diagrams because this is a way of this is a way of computing the canonical form. Uh, by summing over all vertices, every vertex is associated with a Feynman diagram, and I'm just multiplying one over the product of all the x's that meet at that vertex. So it's just this one over just the product of all the propagators associated with every vertex, and I sum up all the vertices. Okay, but we can also see why Feynman diagrams are breaking the projective invariance. We see it very clearly if I go back to my even we can do the sort of a pentagon example, or we can do it. But we can uh, we can do any example. Um, but you remember the the point was that these triangulations that that the that the triangulation of uh, uh, of uh, polytopes or polygons associated with this uh, uh, with this summing over all vertices picture was taking your polytope and taking every vertex and drawing a triangle that's associated with extending that vertex to this artificial X star. You see, every single term has a singularity on X star. Every single triangle here has a singularity. Every boundary is a singularity at X star, and they only cancel, they only cancel in the whole sum. And so 
that's what's going on uh, it, uh, in when we think about the Feynman diagrams. Um, every Feynman diagram has a singularity at uh, uh, every Feynman diagram has an artificial singularity at infinity, which is canceling out only when we sum over all of them. Um, and uh, so, so it's a very nice triangulation. It's a very canonical triangulation, um, but it's not. Uh, but it obscures something. So Feynman diagrams are obscuring the projective invariant because term by term they have a singularity uh, outside the polytope that only cancels in the whole sum. And as I said, uh, that is something which um, uh, that is something which uh, um, uh, is very in common with what we've seen uh, with dual conformal invariants in n equals four super Yang nulls. Diagram by diagram, um, there is uh, there are some singularities at infinity. Uh, when you go off to infinity uh, in 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 uh, naturally chosen directions, um, and they only cancel when you sum all the diagrams together. But it's not something that you see uh, diagram by diagram. In the case of n equals four super Yang Mills, what makes a dual conformal symmetry obvious ultimately is the amplitohedron, or the connection with the positive Grassmannian and the amplitohedron. Here, what makes the projective invariance obvious is the connection to the isosahedron. Um, and again, in both cases, the usual expansion in terms of uh, uh, local Feynman diagrams, um, term by term, destroys that property. And we only see it as the property of the whole sum. OK, so uh, any questions about that? Um, can I ask you a question about discrete symmetries, how they move us in, in this space? Uh, we, we don't really have any discrete symmetries in this space. There was, a, there was a discrete symmetry, sort of uh, the cyclic rotation of all, all the indices. Um, but uh, interestingly, that cyclic symmetry is sort of, uh, is necessarily broken um, by the fact that I, I, I alluded to, I mean, it's not, it, it's not manifest, um, by the fact that in order to cover all of our xij variables once and only once, we have to do the thing where uh, we, we chose a chunk out of this uh, kinematic space time. Um, other than that, there are no discrete symmetries in the problem that we're, that we're uh, talking about. So under time translation, I, it won't take me to the totally negative space or even, or just uh, keeping us at the positive space, but change the order, like totally switch the order? Uh, like no, that. no. The, the, so uh, the only the only choices you can make here is is you can make a different choice for how you cut out a part of this kinematic space time. And uh, I, I I showed you the story of what you get with a right triangle. You could take any other way of cutting a chunk out of this uh, strip, and they would all give you exactly the same. They'd all give you exactly the same uh, story. Sorry, this X yeah. star. Is that the dual of the center? Yes, the, the X star is the dual of the center of the of the other polygon. And in uh, and uh, uh, if I had longer, I would explain this part a little. Uh, I, I would explain a little better. But in uh, but it, it really uh, in in the in the context that we're talking about here, X star really goes to infinity. Um, so so X star is really the sort of hyperplane at the infinity, and you can see that in the form, right? The form is like dx over x. Dx over x is a singularity to x equals zero, and also at x equals infinity. And so, what is going on is that um, uh, every Feynman diagram has singularities both when the x's go to zero as well as when the x's go to infinity. Remarkably, with all the signs and everything that, well, if we didn't know about the isosahedron, it looks a little bit remarkable that it's possible to assign all the signs and stuff such that amazingly, all the singularities at infinity are gone. Um, the association makes it obvious that there's no singularities at infinity because those singularities are just an artifact of how you're choosing to triangulate. So just, just imagine in this picture that we sent X star to uh, infinity. And yes, there are, there are many other triangulations of the association. I mean, if I wanted to, uh, we could talk about, in fact, you could ask, are there triangulations that make the projective invariance obvious? And there are such triangulations and, uh, and um, they give rise to you know, fast recursion relations for calculating these phi cube tree amplitudes. I mean, it sounds uh, ridiculous that you can do better than Feynman diagrams for such a stupid, simple theory, but you can. Um, uh, and it's exactly because the, the, the symmetry is being made uh, manifest. So there are other, many other triangulations. 
And um, uh, after we come back from another short break, I will also talk about uh, the uh, stringy canonical form associated with this story. Um, uh, so uh, as we'll see in a second, this construction of the associedron is also very naturally associated with a way of representing it as a Minkowski sum. Um, this is something extremely natural from the physics point of view. It's kind of related to a picture of a Green's function. We'll, we'll in this kinematic space. We'll come to it in a second, but we'll see that this associedron is very naturally presented as a Minkowski sum. Every time we have something naturally presented as a Minkowski sum, we can ask, uh, we can get its canonical form in this simple way using the idea of stringy canonical forms. And the remarkable thing is that when we apply that, that very general method that you could do for any old polytope, when you apply it to this particular polytope that we get, this particular sociohedron that we get in kinematic space, the stringy canonical form that we get is called the string amplitude. So we have a picture uh, with no particles or strings. We're just asking this uh, interesting question in the kinematical space. Uh, we, uh, the positivity brings this positive geometry to life, brings this association to life. Uh, now we can ask how we get the canonical form for it. And various way, one way of getting a canonical form is like triangulating in this way with the uh, hyperplane at infinity. That way is called Feynman diagram. There are other ways of triangulating it that keep the projective invariance matter. And if you apply the stringy canonical form method to compute uh, the canonical form of this association at finite alpha prime, what you discover is the string amplitude generalization of these phi cube amplitudes. So we really have sort of come full circle. I started off the whole story by telling you that, uh, that if factorization was the star, you have either particles or strings to make it obvious but that there was more going on, that there was more. There was this combinatorics and geometry that was more hidden. Uh, and so we now have worked to expose that by, by uh, looking at these interesting structures directly in kinematical space. Notice we really just began. There's nothing that looks like a space time. There's nothing that looks like a Hilbert space. We just started with these stupid XIJs, but we found some interesting structure in the space of XIJs, which brings to life the geometry, and then different ways of extracting the information of the canonical form from the geometry either makes obvious the connection to particles or obvious the connection to string. Okay, so that's the, that's the story. Um, so uh, why don't we take uh, maybe another five minute break and we'll come back and start talking. Um, uh, um, uh, maybe I'll just uh, explain slightly more what I just said, but we'll start talking about cluster LP. I have a question. Should I ask now or later after the break? Um, uh, can you ask me two minutes after I grab a coffee? Okay. <laughs> 